。好，我们来看看今天的讨论题目。第一题 ，Why do you think the poem begins with the quote from Dante's Inferno? Why is it not translated? 诗的一开头用引言开头，它引言是引用但丁神曲地狱篇，但是它引用的是意大利文原文。你觉得为什么它没有翻译给你看？为什么要给你意大利文？ Question two: How would you describe the speaker physically and mentally based on what evidence? 你会如何描述诗里面的说话的人？然后为什么会这样子描述他？是身体跟心理上你会如何描述他 ？Question three: Who do you think is the addressee of the poem, and who is the we of the last stanza? Why do you think so? 你觉得这首诗在跟谁讲话？然后最后一诗节提到一个 we， 你又觉得 we 是谁？我问你为什么这么觉得 ？Question four: Why do you think the poem has so many descriptions of outdoor and indoor environments？ 你觉得为什么这首诗有这么多次描述室内、室外场景？这些场景的重要性可能在哪里？ Question five: Do you think this is a dramatic monologue? Why or why not? If yes, compare it with the other two we have read in this class. How are they similar? How are they different? 你觉得这首诗也算是戏剧独白的一种吗？如果觉得是的话，请跟我们之前读过两篇做比较，他们哪边哪些地方一样，哪些地方不一样？啊，如果你觉得不是的话，为什么长得这么像？啊、uh, ，然后还有第六题 ，right？ 那个 ，How can you tell that this poem was written in the 20th century？ 如何得知这首诗是二十世纪的作品？好，我们来分配题目。第一题给第五组，对吗？第五组算是你们做第一题吗？是吗？哦，好，那你第一题给第四组，呃，第二题给第三组。第三题给第二组，第四题给第一组，第五题给第七组，第六题给第六组，然后第五组，请做第三题，可以吗？给你们十分钟讨论。
。好，我们来看看你们的想法吧。第一题，第四组，你们觉得这首诗为什么要用但丁神曲开头？哎、欸，我应该走过去。好，而且没有翻译。好，所以第四组觉得，首先为什么诗人没有翻译给读者？为什么是留给编辑去翻译呢？呃，这个部分第四组提醒我们说，是因为艾略特是一个现代主义诗人，现代主义的诉求之一呢，就是要排斥大众读者。你要有那个底蕴，你要有那个那个知识，一定知识水准，他才欢迎你进入他的诗作里。所以，如果你意大利文看不懂的话，你这首诗你就不用读了，大概这个意思。嗯、呃，但当时的人应该预测不到说，呃，随着二十世纪的进展，就是懂得各种语言的人越来越少，所以至今我们读这首诗，呃，需要注释的协助。那至于为什么选《但丁神曲》这一段当做谢子呢？第四组提醒我们说，呃，这一段的内容，如果你看翻译的话，那我想一下，你们《但丁神曲》读过吗？没有，那我可能要讲一下。好，所以《丹尼神曲》在干嘛？就是他是在讲说，主角在遇到中年危机迷途之路的时候呢，找到一个洞穴，然后往下走，居然走到地狱去了。然后呢，他就呃越往下走，钻呃经过地狱九层，呃，然后经过就到最下面那层就是撒旦在那边。然后呢，经过撒旦之后就进到炼狱，然后炼狱呃也有九层。走完之后呢，开始进到天堂，然后又往往上走了九层，最后除了看到上帝之外呢，也看到他的爱人也在上面，就是这样的故事。那所以，嗯、呃，这边是引用自地狱篇，就是前三分之一在走地狱的部分，在地狱里面他看到的各式各样的当时知名人物以及历史人物，呃，通常被认为犯大罪的人啊，或是他其实想要借这首诗去批评的那些人。然后呢，会呃，作者把每一个这样的这一号人物呢，安排一个适得其所的酷刑。所以，譬如说，呃，在世的时候八卦太多，他到地狱的时候可能就是呃，舌头长得很大，然后水喝不下去，食物吃不下去，类似这样子。那这边这段是引用自主角遇到的一个人，他正在受酷刑。那主角因为他是主角，所以他就问这个人说：“哎，你怎么了？怎么会变这样？”啊，这个人的答案是说，我本来是不会想跟你讲的啦，但是我看你都已经来到地狱了，应该是回不去了。那我跟你分享应该也无妨。那所以第四组看到这一段，他们觉得说，哎，这个答这个答复蛮蛮有意思的。为什么如果主角回得去的话，这个人就不愿意不愿意跟他分享他的人生故事呢？是不是因为他怕说，呃，没有？亲口听他讲的人，就是以讹传讹的听到的人，会缺乏同理心，会没办法了解为什么这件事情是多么痛苦。呃，那进一步去想，会不会是觉得说自己为自己的行为感到羞愧，希望听到他人生故事的人也可以了解他的羞愧之心，而不是随便当做一个譬如说都市传说在讲。那从这边我们就可以连回这首诗嘛。因为这首诗也是在讲一个充满自卑心理的一个中年男子的故事，好像也是遇到就是人生，呃，中年危机的迷途之际，嗯、呃，那有点像是他引用的这个人嘛，就是心里充满自卑、羞愧的心，然后不愿意让人知道，除非你真的可以了解感受。啊，这首诗就这样嘛，呃，直接听这个 Proof Rock 这个人主角跟我们讲话，然后。他对我们倾诉，希望我们也可以理解他的心理。这个好像有点跳到第三第三题去了，但总之想法大概就是这样子。好，所以谢谢第四组，其他组别有想法或要提问吗？
好，我们进到第二题。呃，第三组你们会如何描述我们的主角的身心状况？哎 ，waiter， 等一下。嗯，他的整首诗看起来很消沉。然后第一百一十一呃一百一十七行到一百二十行看得出来他，他他蛮叹息他自己老了。然后里面也有提到他头秃了，所以。有消沉的感觉，也有自卑的感觉。好，谢谢。所以心理状况，第三组觉得他是一个很消沉的心理状态。那呃，好像没有一个特别哪一句是关键，因为通篇的感觉就是让你觉得很阴郁消沉。呃，那基本上全部都是同同一个人的视角出发，所以呃，谁讲的？苏东坡讲说，你心里有大便，看到什么都是大便，类似这种感觉。他心里很消沉，看到什么都很消沉。那生理上如何描述他呢？呃，刚刚第三组提到一百一十七行那边，你们是讲这里吗 ？Full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous. 正好是讲他内心状况嘛，就是他觉得自己好像。呃，蛮荒谬的，有点有点迟钝。呃，第注释二 ，high sentence 是说充满的呃想法，那不一定是好的想法，就是看到什么事情都有意见。所以这个一百一十七行这边是对于自己的一种批评，觉得自己不足的地方。那第三组又提到他秃头，秃头在哪里？诶。啊，这边四十行。With a bald spot in the middle of my hair， 也是地中海秃。They will say how his hair is growing thin， 他头发越来越稀疏了。那我们还可以继续往下看两行。My morning coat， my collar mounting firmly to the chin， 啊，早晨穿的外套那个领子一直到下巴那边去了，好像有点比平常人还要高，好像在遮掩什么。也有可能讲他脖子比较短，然后下一行 ，my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin， 所以有打领带，领领带好像也蛮呃茂盛的，就是譬如说颜色饱满之类的，但是却又不是很抢眼，因为它是一个 modest， 然后上面别的针也是非常简单，所以嗯、呃、好像。底蕴是很丰富，但是表面要就是弄得很很简单谦虚。那会想要这样打扮的人，可能就是呃自己心里觉得自己很好，但是总觉得好像不被世界接受，所以产生一种自卑心理。外在呈现的部分就不敢太嚣张，类似这样吧。所以我们就是可以以这样的方式理解我们的主角。就是心里很自卑，然后消沉，然后身体上进到中年，呃，开始，你知道，就是我不知道你们知不知道，你们都还蛮年轻的，<笑>就是年轻的时候不可能不会太有感受到，就是自己身体的各种能量跟可能性，但就是这些东西渐渐失去之后，你才会发现啊，当初是拥有这些东西的。所以他已经到了中年，开始觉得自己已经不年轻了。原本的各种潜能、各种能量、各种可能性，好像也渐渐都消失了。所以身体跟心理这是一体的两面呢。好，谢谢第三组，其他组备有想法或是要提问吗？好，我们看第三题，这是第二，我们先看第二组，好，因为第五组也有回答这个问题。第二组，你们觉得这首诗在跟谁讲话，或者什么样的人讲话？
你觉得他在跟自己讲话啊？所以他是，哦，这个答案还蛮有趣的，有可能哦，有可能在跟自己讲话。嗯，因为首先我们没有看到这个 you 是谁嘛，没有什么描述啊、嗯，所以他是一个很抽象的存在。然后我们又看到这个 you 的角色，好像就是一个陪伴的角色，或是倾听的角色。那其实这想法蛮有趣的。谁说一定要有另外一个人呢？也许还是跟自己，就是譬如说在面对镜子讲话，有没有跟自己讲话，给自己打气，也在给自己倾诉，也有可能。呃，然后你们觉得最后一师姐的 we， 哦，这样就等于也回答了嘛？因为没有第二个人，所以就是本来就包含自己。哦，好天才哦！好，谢谢第二组。这一题也问了第五组。那第五组的讲的想法是，这个 you 其实是读者，就是如果这个 you 的功能是一个倾听、伴随、打气的角色，那何尝不就是读者本身？嗯，主角说话给读者听，是希望读者能够去，呃。感同身受，能够希望把读者拉到自己这边来，站在同一条阵线上。所以到最后一时节，那个 we 其实是有一种期许，主角希望到了最后一时节的时候，读者确实跟他站在一起。所以当他说我的感受是这样的时候，读者也会认同，觉得说这个 we 也包含我读者在里面。我们可以看一下最后一时节。We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed, red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. 我们处在海里的，不管你要说房间还是洞穴都可以。然后由海里的女子穿着打扮靓丽，用用叫什么海苔，穿着打扮靓丽，伴呃陪伴着。直到人的声音把我们唤醒，我们才淹死。那这很明显是一种象征嘛？他不是真的处在海底，呃，是讲说他处的那个状况，呃，处在某一种危险状况，浑而不知。呃，那伴随着就是他眼前他喜欢的那个女人以及他的朋友嘛，就是他觉得过得还不错啦，然后也许有希望啦、啊，直到最后清醒了，他才发现啊，已经来不及了，其实没有救了。所以，其实整首诗的经历跟体悟都隐含在最后一世界里面。那所以，这个 we 如果有根据第五组的说法，如果主角成功的话，那这一世界的 we 也会包含读者。读者，我们也会也会觉得说，啊，对啦，跟你这个倒霉鬼就是一起经历这些事情，确实有这样的感受。但是如果主角失败的话，如果我们从一个外在的角度看这个人以及他的处境，我们可能只会觉得他很可怜，甚至有点可比。啊、呃，这个时候那个 we 就失败了，就不含读者，讲的单纯只是自己而已。就就是看你能不能感同身受，还是你觉得这个人实在就是太可笑了。好，谢谢第二组、第五组，其他组别有想法或提问吗？好，第四题，关于场景的描述，呃，我们休息一下，等一下回来再再回答。呃，上一周没有听到的人，我再讲一遍哈、哦，下一节课我会改用英文，因为谢生要派一个人来拍招生宣传影片。啊、呃，然后所以也希望大家不要先跑掉，就是稍微冲个场面。所以那个等摄影师离开之后，我再让你们签到点名。啊，不要太担心，我已经那个有。There will be subtitles so that you can keep up with what I'm saying. <音>好，我们休息一下。
The bell has rung. Please take your seats. Let's continue the discussion. Uh, so from past experience, I know that the cameraman likes to sneak into the classroom. But I'm pretty sure that we'll notice when he comes. OK, so we were talking about question four. Why does the poem have so many descriptions of outdoor and indoor environments? Um, I had a chat with group one during the break, and they believe that this kind of description is to help create a fuller atmosphere of uh, insecurity, melancholy, all of these sad and negative emotions. So for example, let's take a look at the opening sentences of the poem. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Uh, so line three is talking about uh, when someone has to have surgery, right? They're lying on the table and the medicine makes them go unconscious. In the past, that medicine was called ether. So etherized means uh, made unconscious on the surgery table. So it's comparing the evening sky to a surgery patient. It's a very strange comparison. Uh, it probably doesn't give you a clear image, but it does give you a clear feeling like this evening sky is lacking in energy, lifeless, almost dead, right? Needing to be saved on the surgery table. All very uh, pessimistic feelings, very melancholy, sad feelings. Uh, let's continue, line four. Let us go through certain half deserted streets. So the streets are half empty. Maybe there should have been more people, but there are only one or two people, something like that. Line five, the muttering retreats. Here the poem is talking about like if you're walking on the street, there are already not a lot of people. But let's say you meet somebody. Instead of saying hello, that person quickly walks away. They don't want to talk to you. So. Um, it's worse than being alone in the city. If you're alone in the city, it's just you. But if you meet someone in the city and they run away, it's even more lonely. You have been rejected. Line six of restless nights in one night cheap hotels. I think this image is pretty clear. Cheap hotels, restless nights, not getting a lot of sleep. Next line. And sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Uh, so oysters are like clams, right? Like a bank. Um, in London at that time, oysters were considered a cheap source of protein energy. Uh, so again, cheap. And sawdust restaurants. Sawdust is um, a saw is the, the kind of blade you use to cut down a tree. And when you're cutting down a tree, it will spit out dust, right? So um, And so a sawdust restaurant is a restaurant that lays the floor with sawdust. Why would a restaurant do that? Because usually in this type of restaurant, there are many people going in and out with dirty shoes, lots of beer spilled on the floor, lots of food spilled on the floor. The floor is just incredibly dirty and messy. So instead of having somebody with a broom 
chasing everybody around to sweep everything up. They just let things fall on the ground. And when the restaurant closes at the end of the day, they'll use the sawdust to collect everything together. So this tells us that this kind of restaurant is cheap. Uh, and the customers are also lower class. And it's a messy place. So again, it's not a very happy image. Line eight. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent. So a tedious argument. You know how sometimes when you uh, argue with somebody and you've been arguing for a while and then you suddenly realize that you're not actually talking about anything important. Right, it's just uh, meaningless details. You're not even sure why you're, you're still arguing with this person. That is a tedious argument. So streets that follow like a tedious argument. When you're walking these streets, you're not, it doesn't feel like you're actually going anywhere. Uh, you're not lost, but it doesn't feel like it means anything to walk this way or that way. Uh, so it's a way of describing uh, the experience of being in this city. But it's not just useless or meaningless. Line nine says of insidious intent, which means with bad intentions. So the city isn't just meaningless, it's actually trying actively to make you feel bad. Like it's doing this specifically to you. Um, so like these are some of the imagery of indoor and outdoor. And then in line 15, we have even more. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. So at the time, the air pollution was terrible. City air was just terrible. So the fog, which is natural, is yellow, which is not natural. Uh, it smells bad, bad for your health. Rubs its back upon the window pane. Uh, window pane is the glass in the window. OK, so you get the idea, right? The yellow fog comes up to the window. But why does it say it rubs its back upon the window? Let's look at the next line. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes. OK, so very similar, except instead of fog, we have smoke. And instead of back, we have muzzle. The muzzle is like a dog's nose and mouth. It's it's like the triangle shape in front of a dog. So it's comparing this fog or smoke to a yellow dog. What kind of dog would you meet on the street? A uh, stray dog, uh, maybe a sick dog, an abandoned dog. Never a happy dog, especially in a big city. So it's telling you about the air pollution and it's making you feel like this city has abandoned its outdoor environment. Um, so in general, like these descriptions of indoor and outdoor environments are all pretty negative. So going back to the question, why are there so many? And I think at this point we can uh, go back to the previous question when we mentioned that the entire poem is told through the perspective of the speaker, the protagonist. So when he feels sad and useless and insecure, everything he sees adds to that feeling. And so that's how the poem is trying to put us in his position. That's how the poem makes us feel what he feels, by describing the world as he sees it. Uh, and this is a much more powerful way of conveying emotion than simply saying he felt insecure. Because if, if the poem just simply said, he felt insecure, I feel insecure, 
OK, we understand, but we don't feel it. Uh, it it's a piece of knowledge instead of a piece of experience. But if you can change everything that you see and feel into the same kind of uh, sight and feeling as the protagonist and the speaker sees and feels, that immediately puts us into his position. And that's partly why this poem is so long, right? There's so many descriptions of these environments. Uh, so do you have questions or comments about the question four? All right, let's move on to question five. Uh, during the break, I had the chance to talk with group seven, and they believe that this poem is a dramatic monologue. Uh, if we recall, a dramatic monologue is when the speaker is not the author, and it's usually some kind of important or famous person from history or from legends. Now, that is the first main difference, according to Group 7, between this poem and the previous two dramatic monologues that we have read, which is the protagonist, the speaker of this poem, is not famous. That's kind of the point. He's a regular dude, a regular middle-aged, balding, kind of short, insecure man. So even though he's not someone we would know, he is a kind of person that we would understand. And this is a very important part of this poem. This poem would not make sense if we thought of the speaker as the poet, the poet, the author. Um, the, the poet very specifically creates this character for us to look through his eyes and see the world from his perspective. So it, even though it's not a famous person, it could still be called a dramatic monologue. So comparing with the other two that we read, I think last week. Um, yes, last week. No, 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 two weeks ago. Uh, group seven says that in this poem, the speaker is kind of afraid of getting old. He's in middle age. He doesn't know what he can do with his life, doesn't know if he has time for love anymore. But in Ulysses, uh, the speaker embraces the good parts of being old. We talked about this two weeks ago. Like even though getting old, you lose things, but you still keep things. And being old has its own kind of honor and glory. And he says that there will always be time to keep exploring the world and the future. So this attitude is the complete opposite of Proof Rock, the speaker of this poem. As for the comparison with My Last Duchess, Group 7 believes that these two are actually kind of similar. We know that the speaker of the Last Duchess, My Last Duchess, is jealous of his wife, or I guess wives. Every wife that he has, he's jealous. Uh, and Group 7 points out that jealousy often stems from insecurity and uh, shame or inferiority. Only when you think that your partner might run off with someone else would you feel jealous. In other words, you have to feel like other people are better than you. Uh, and if you don't have that feeling, you would not feel jealous. So yes, both the, the speakers of both poems are insecure. Uh, and they want, either they want a woman or they want to keep a woman. Uh, but even more than that, another broader similarity is that in these two poems, the reader is not necessarily meant to identify with the speaker. We're not always meant to think, oh yes, I know that feeling. I agree, that's correct. Uh, in these two poems, we're more likely to think of the speaker as a character, as a person in a situation. And as a reader, we can therefore judge the speaker. We can say that the speaker of My Last Duchess is jealous and clingy and maybe even murderous. 
And we can say that the speaker of this poem is insecure and needy and maybe even pitiful. Uh, deserving our pity. So that's another similarity. OK, uh, other groups, do you have questions or comments about this one? OK, and then we have one more question to discuss. How can you tell that this poem was written in the 20th century? Um, group six mentioned a few ideas. Uh, let's look at the handout. This poem was written quite early, so a lot of the stuff in the second half uh, probably will not match. But we can look at, for example, uh, these three lines. Let's go from the third line. Free verse. Poems that are not bound by the rules of meter and rhyme and structure. You can write whatever you want. Is this poem bound by meter and structure or is it a more free kind of poem? Group six thinks that it is a more free kind of poem. They think that it is free verse. And it's true. If you um, if you don't look at the meaning, but you just look at the shape of the words on the page. It does not look regular, right? There are all different kinds of shapes, all different lengths of words of, of each line. It's true there is some structure, right? You have stanzas, you have um, you have repeated lines, you sometimes you have rhymes, but it's not regular. There's no fixed pattern. So we can say that this is a work of free verse. We can also say that it's a work of stream of consciousness. This is the idea that the speaker or protagonist's thoughts are given to the reader directly. There's nobody saying uh, this is what he thought. It's just directly given to us. So group six um, focused on Let's see. Line 23, this stanza. Uh, this stanza and the next stanza. No, this stanza and then the stanza two after. So the two stanzas that begin with, and indeed there will be time. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Uh, in this case, it means like preparing yourself, uh, deciding what kind of expression and appearance you want to present to other people. There will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Uh, so this is a fancy way of saying there will be time to ask the question. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions or things you cannot decide. And for a hundred visions and revisions. So here vision means something that you expect or that you imagine. And revision, of course, means that uh, no, 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 it won't be like that. It'll be like this. No, 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 it won't be like this. It'll be like that. It's another kind of indecision. All before the taking of a toast and tea. Uh, so this stanza seems to be the speaker's thoughts directly. He's thinking to himself or he, like maybe he's talking to the reader or something that there will be time for all of these things. There will be enough time in my life. But like he keeps repeating this idea that there will be time enough. So do you feel like he believes this or is he trying to comfort himself? 
Is he trying to reassure himself, to convince himself that there will indeed be enough time? If he's trying to comfort himself, that means he does not believe there will be enough time. So uh, this is something that we have to think about in order to see. In other words, there's nobody in the poem telling us, no, no, he doesn't actually believe there's enough time. We only get the speaker's own thoughts, and we have to judge for ourselves what those thoughts are actually meaning. So, yes, there is stream of consciousness here. OK, let's go up one line to modernism. Uh, one of the key points of modernism is that the authors don't want any person to be able to understand. They only want to write for people who they think deserve to understand because they have enough education. They come from the right background. They have worked to try to understand. And this goes back to question one, the opening with the Italian Dante and no translation. That's a very modernist thing to do. And then finally, the first line, 1915. James Fraser's The Golden Bough is a collection of myths and legends. And we know that the modernists love to use these ideas and images in their work. So a uh, group what group are we on? Group six? Yeah, group six pointed out that these things are in the poem. First of all, Dante, right? The very beginning that counts. Uh, and then you also have. Michelangelo, Tana, very famous person from history. Uh, and then you actually have some things uh, that are hidden in the footnotes. Again, the poem does not explain things. You have to know them already. So for example, there will be time. The editor tells us that this is a reference to an Andrew Marvell poem. This is from the 17th century to his coy mistress. Had we but world enough and time. And then uh, in this line, the works and days of hands, the editor says this is a reference to uh, the ancient Greek poet Hesiod, who wrote a book of poems called Works and Days. So like all of these things are scattered throughout the poem. Uh, and if you know about these things, it hopefully adds to the meaning and the enjoyment of reading this poem. But even if you don't know about these things, uh, for example, that last stanza, right, being underneath the sea. Uh, like for us, I think the first thing we think of is like the Little Mermaid, right? And that itself is based on an older legend. So even for we people who don't know about this stuff, well, I guess you don't know, I kind of know. Um, but for people who don't know about this stuff, culture has a tendency to spread downward. Uh, and so you might still have a certain feeling for older myths and legends. OK, uh, do you guys have questions or ideas about question six? OK, if not, um, I want to first introduce what we're going to be doing next week, and then we'll come back and talk about this poem in more detail. So next week we're going to be reading some poetry from the First World War. We're going to be reading the work of two poets, Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. These are the two most famous um, soldier poets of the First World War from Britain. The thing about the First World War 
is that it was the first large scale mechanized war in Europe. Um, the previous, oh, I guess the first uh, mechanized war in the world is this, the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. But Europeans did not experience that war. They did not know how warfare was changed by the Industrial Revolution. In the old days, for example, in the American Revolutionary War of 1776, um, the guns were so weak that the two armies could not just shoot at each other. Beyond a certain distance, the gun could not hit you. So what they did back then was the two sides would form into lines and they would get closer and closer and closer and they had to judge. The distance has to be small enough that the gun can hit the enemy and actually cause damage. But at the same time, they can't wait too long or the enemy will fire first. So it's a timing issue. Imagine going from that to machine guns and like uh, artillery. It's a completely different kind of warfare. But at the beginning of the First World War, all of these European countries had not thought about the influence of this new technology. To give one short example, the British Army was still wearing bright red coats. They did this in the past because um, when the enemy saw the British Army, the most powerful army in the world, they would get scared and might not fight the British. And the British didn't have to care about hiding because the guns were so weak that you could see the enemy and still not be able to hit them. But in the, in the First World War, it was completely different. Rifles, machine guns. Um, you could hit somebody that you can't even see that's far away. And so at the beginning of the war, when the British soldiers put on their red coats and entered battle, they were just massacred. Uh, everybody just died very, very quickly. Uh, and so, of course, the British Army very quickly decided to change their uniform. Uh, so this is one example of how unprepared European armies were for the First World War. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, before the war started, people still had a very romantic idea of warfare. This idea that you are fighting one on one and a contest of wills to see who is the stronger man. And if you win, you get honor and glory and you get to call yourself the winner. That's before machine guns. But after machine guns, if you survive the war, the only reason is not because you were brave, not because you are the better soldier, it's because you were lucky. And so this is a completely different, different way of thinking about warfare. So what happened was when the army started killing each other terribly, the generals start slowly realized what was wrong and they changed the tactics, but they did not tell people at home what was going on. Everybody at home still thought of the war as this glorious adventure. And a lot of people did not realize just how many people were dying. And so this is the reason why these two poets wrote their war poems. They wrote them to be published at home so that the public would have a sense of what was really going on in this war. So next week, we're going to be reading five of these war poems. And as you can imagine, they are incredibly powerful because they were written so that the public would truly understand and feel how dangerous and, and full of suffering war really was. I have to admit, 
I teach these poems uh, every year, and every year they make me cry. They're just really powerful poems. Right, and we can also talk about the two poets. Siegfried Sassoon uh, was a poet before he went to war. And uh, after one battle, he was injured, and so he was in the hospital. And in the same hospital room, he met a young guy named Wilfred Owen, who is our second poet. At that time, Wilfred Owen was not a poet. He was just a soldier. But they got to talking, and Wilfred Owen agreed that the public should learn what war is really like. And so because of Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen became a poet. Wilfred Owen died one week before the war was over. Siegfried Sassoon lived a long life, but as he grew older, he became more conservative. He uh, turned to religion, became a Catholic, uh, but he was also gay. So he, the second half of his life was very uh, contradictory, and he suffered a lot of internal anguish. Uh, there, there is a, a movie about his life that came out recently. It's called Benediction. Uh, so if you want to know more about him, you can watch that movie. Uh, in English, I'm uh, sorry, in Chinese, Benediction is Zhufu, kind of like blessing. I can't remember the Chinese title of this movie. So anyway, that's what we're going to be doing next week. Uh, be sure to read the poems before you come to class. So let's go back and uh, look at today's poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. After discussing this poem, I'm sure you can tell that this title is kind of ironic, you know, Feng Si. Is it a love song? Yes, but it's a failure of a love. It's not a successful love. And the speaker is named J. Alfred Prufrock which is about as unheroic a name as you could think of. You can't imagine J. Alfred Prufrock going into war uh, against Troy. You can't imagine J. Alfred Prufrock being a great general. This is a very middle class name. A very, uh, we call this bourgeois name. And yet we're going to be reading about the song of this very average and normal dude. Uh, we talked about the first stanza. Uh, so line eight. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Dot, dot, dot. So like we're expecting, what is the question? But in the next line, he says, oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. So he's so insecure that he's not even willing to share the question that he wants to ask of his love. Instead, he says, don't worry about it. Let's go first. So like, where are they going? They're going to visit the woman that he loves. They go, and in the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Uh, these two lines appear several times in the poem. But like, think of how the speaker thinks of like what's going to happen. He wants to ask his lover or the, the woman that he loves, like, will you be my lover? Like something like that. He wants to confess his feelings. Uh, and so like we can think he's imagining some kind of grand situation and maybe the woman will be completely like uh, blown head over heels and will deeply love him. It's a very romantic scene. But instead he enters the room and what does he see? The women come and go. Nobody really cares about him. Nobody notices him. They come and they go. And when they talk, they're talking of Michelangelo. 
Now, I'm pretty sure they're not actually talking about Michelangelo. Um, this is a symbol for all of the things that they might talk about. Michelangelo is most famous for his statue of David, right? The huge, strong guy. So they might be talking about men in terms of their physical beauty. They might be talking about uh, stories from the old days. Michelangelo liked to make art about uh, legends and stories also. So maybe these women are talking about gossip uh, or like telling old stories. In any case, what they are not talking about is what if some guy comes and proposes to me? They're not sitting there waiting for a man to show up. So this is completely the opposite of what Prufrock was expecting. Uh, the next stanza is describing the city nighttime with the yellow fog. We basically talked about this. Uh, air pollution right here, soot, soot that falls from chimneys. When you burn something in your house and it comes out the chimney and then like the dust is the soot and it falls back down. Uh, the next stanza we also talked about, but now we understand why the last line, line 34, is before the taking of a toast and tea. At this point, Prufrock is already in the room with the women, and yet he still cannot open his mouth to ask the question. He keeps telling himself, no, no, there will be time later, don't rush before the taking of a toast and tea. So like before this part of the gathering ends and they move on to eating an afternoon snack or something. So in fact, we notice that he's not just comforting himself. He's actually rationalizing his decision not to ask the question yet. In, in truth, he's just scared. He's insecure, but he tells himself there's no rush. You can take your time. Women come and go talking of Michelangelo, and indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? So these are two different moments, right? The first moment, do I dare ask the question? And then later he asked himself again. So apparently the first moment he decided not to ask the question. Uh, and because the poem is not ended yet, we know that even the second time he still does not ask the question. Time to turn back and descend the stair. So now we can see that he's really scared, right? He's he feels very insecure. He wants to run away. Uh, and so at this point, he starts thinking about his bald spot. And so he imagines when he leaves, the women will see his bald hair and notice that he is going bald. Morning coat, necktie. Line 44. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. So like. Even the parts of his body that are OK, he feels are not uh, handsome, are not good enough. Do I dare disturb the universe? I love this line. He has given himself so much pressure that it feels like there's nothing he can do. And so if he really does ask the question, it feels like something so big it could disturb the universe. It's like changing fate or destiny. In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. So again, he's thinking, should I ask? No, should I ask? No, going back and forth inside himself. For I have known them all already, known them all. Known what? Next line. 
have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. Uh, here he's talking about tea time. He has measured his life in how many times he has gone to tea with this woman. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So he's been here so many times that he's very familiar with the rhythm of the day in this place. He knows all the evenings and mornings and afternoons in this place. He knows what they feel like, what will happen. He knows all of the instances of afternoon tea. He can even he even knows the voice from the next room beneath the sound of music. It is all very familiar to him. So how should I presume? Presume here means uh, how should how can I imagine that she actually loves me? The idea here is that he is so familiar and yet she has never expressed interest in him. It's like uh, so therefore he's he's building a situation that is unfavorable to himself. The more he thinks, the less likely uh, in his mind he will succeed. Next stanza. And I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. Here the word fix does not mean repair. Fix means to hold you in place so that you cannot move. A formulated phrase. So it's a phrase that they, ha they have built very carefully. It's a very careful uh, sentence. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. So like when a woman turns to him and asks him a question and looks at him, he feels like he cannot move. And when I am formulated sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall. So this image is like he's a butterfly that has been pinned to the wall. Then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? A butt end is when you smoke a cigarette and it and the very last part is called the butt end. So he's comparing his own life to meaningless things. He says that his life is completely meaningless. How can he share this kind of life? What kind of answer is he able to give when the women ask him questions? There's nothing he can say that would be meaningful, he thinks. And so how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare. So here he's describing the women's arms for some reason. But in the lamplight, down with light brown hair. Um, so like Western people tend to have a bit more body hair than we do. Um, so he's saying like, the arms look white and bare, but under the light, you can see there's a little bit of body hair on these women's arms. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? What, like, am I thinking so many different things because I smell their perfume? Obviously not, that's an excuse. Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. A shawl is a, a pigeon. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? So when he's describing the women's arms, he's describing these women as not people, more like museum pieces, like statues. Like he's there to admire the women. He is already putting himself outside of this group of people. And of course, we the reader know that the more outside he is, 
the less likely he will succeed to win the woman's love. But what he doesn't know is that there's nothing stopping him. He is doing this to himself by overthinking this situation. Uh, let's stop here.